Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Mercif sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that later. Will healthcare systems bear a greater responsibility for public health? such as testing and vaccine administration? Are doctors leaving private practice for employment by health systems? These are two questions we discuss with Dr. Tom Balzazak, Chief Clinical Officer of Yale New Haven Health. Dr. Balzazak provides insight into the role of the Chief Clinical Officer, its place in the C-suite and evolution over time. He describes how Yale New Haven Health fared during the pandemic Dr. Balzazak points to the benefits of scale and high integration across the health system. He credits the entrepreneurial healthcare employees who filled gaps in staffing and experience in treating COVID patients. We touch on technology and healthcare and the balance of opportunities and burdens. Dr. Balzazak predicts that we will have greater focus on turning data into usable information and fewer streams of data. Dr. Balzazak forecasts future staffing challenges due to the changing demographics of the workforce, plus competition from sectors that historically have not competed with healthcare. For young leaders, Dr. Balzazak advises that opportunity favors the person who looks for it. Good afternoon, Tom, and welcome. Hi, Gary, it's great to be here. We're pleased to have you at the microphone. You know, this show is about leadership, how we pursue leadership excellence, how we remain top leaders. And you've been a top leader at Yale for a number of years. We'll dig into that in a moment. But first, let's get to know you a bit better, Tom. What was life like growing up? So, uh, you know, not that interesting. I grew up in Connecticut, which is where I am now. Um, I'm the youngest of four children. Uh, growing up, uh, grew up in a middle-class suburban neighborhood. You know, my parents didn't have much education. Um, mom was a secretary. Uh, dad, I think he got his GED when I was seven or eight years old and was involved in the trades, moved around in jobs when I was young, I ended up as an as a electrician. And, uh, you know, the expectation was the four of us, with me being the caboose, that we would go to college and, you know, they had the perspective that, you know, that we needed to be trained, like learn a trade, you know, look at engineering. My brothers uh, went to engineering school. My sister ended up in manufacturing. And, you know, we, we were all expected to find something, a set of skills that would get us employment. Well, what did the young Tom think about leadership? You know, not a lot, Gary, not a lot. You know, I, I don't think that that concept of leadership as we think about it today was anything I ever put any time or effort or thought into. Um, certainly now looking back, you know, there's a lot of leaders, great leaders that I met, including those in my own family. You know, I, I look at stuff that, that my siblings and my parents and others in my family did, and, and I can really see the essence of leadership there. But, you know, it was a little bit like water to the fish. It was all around, but you didn't necessarily recognize it for what it was at the time. When did you begin to think about medicine, Tom? You know, again, I think in retrospect, that's a lot clearer to me than it was at the time. Uh, I had I had majored in chemistry in college with the idea that I would go on and, and get a degree in chemistry. And I toyed with the idea of medicine, but it wasn't really until uh, a summer working in a lab, in a chemistry lab, doing a biochemistry project that I decided that the hard sciences uh, were, were not for me and that I would pursue a career in medicine. Um, and again, I had always grown up working with my hands and fixing things and rebuilding cars and those kinds of things. And 
I, I thought that it would be really neat to combine that interest with my interest in sports. And at the time I was a competitive swimmer in college and, and uh, had an interest in, in orthopedics and injuries and you know, how people, you know, the mechanics of how do you prevent or, or cure injuries. And so I, I said, mm, maybe I could merge my interest in science with my interest in mechanics and with sports. And I really toyed with the idea of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. I have to ask the question, what strokes did you uh, swim in college? Well, I was a freestyler, but my real, my, uh, my, my go-to stroke, my strength was backstroke. Ah, do you still swim? No, you know, it's funny. It, it's, that's a really good question. And I found that once you achieve a certain level in something, it's hard to go back and dabble at it. And so, you know, I dabbled for a while in swimming and thought about master swimming, but I, you know, I never will be as fast as I was in college. And it just didn't feel right to go back and, and try to attain something that's just at this point unattainable. So I've been putting my energies more recently into learning how to row. Uh, and my wife convinced me to join a local rowing club. So that's, that's my current pursuit. In, in the well, that sounds world. like fun. Good, that's good, good fun. exercise. Fun. So yes. fast forwarding, after 17 years in private practice, you uh, began to become more of an administrative leader. Um, was that a tough adjustment for you, Tom? Not really, Gary, because, you know, I had, uh, I, I had when I finished my residency, my wife made a decision to do a second residency. And that really closed the door uh, for doing a fellowship and pursuing perhaps a more clinically focused uh, set of roles. So for those 17 years, I was in private practice part time and doing quality projects and and really helping uh, the then chief medical officer or chief of staff at the hospital uh, work on things that were important to the administration. So I had sort of a hand in both worlds. Uh, and, you know, as I became busier, as the needs of the institution grew and as I filled some of those needs, I found that I was able to spend less and less time with my patients. And it was really, it was a decision that I had to decide I was gonna go one direction or another. Uh, and it was just a few short years ago that I um, closed my, uh, my private practice. A, a very hard decision, but really I was not giving my patients the right level of service. I was not able to commit the kind of time that I needed to. And I'm very grateful for the ability to have that background uh, and, and bring that to my, my, my administrative responsibility. And that's something that I think is really important for any aspiring physician leader, which is to have you know, a very solid clinical background and having uh, walked the shoes of what it's uh, walked in the shoes of those who are full time clinicians. Well, you're now the chief clinical officer at Yale New Haven Health. Could you describe Yale New Haven Health for us, Tom? Sure. You know, we are uh, what I would call a, a mid-sized health system with a very large uh, academic medical center here in New Haven. I think we were fourth or fifth in terms of size of, of hospital uh, in the United States. We're a 1,541-bed academic medical center here in New Haven uh, with 2,500 total beds across the 100 miles. Uh, that's the coastline of Connecticut with a little incursion into the center of the state. But we really serve the southern half of the state of Connecticut um, from the New York border all the way through and into Rhode Island. Uh, we have about 30,000 employees, $6 billion of revenue, uh, and about 6,800 or so um, uh, medical staff with 1,500 residents and, and fellows. Just to get a feel for it, as chief clinical officer, what are your primary responsibilities? So, you know, I have uh, responsibilities for a lot of what historically has been a chief physician executive uh, for a hospital or now a health system. Um, and, you know, I am uh, part of the CEO council uh, in the chief physician executive for that CEO council. So I have uh, under in my span, I have, of course, the chief medical officers and the medical staff office functions with credentialing and privileging and the like. Uh, I have uh, the chief nurse exec uh, reports through me and as a matrix to her, of course, all the CNEs. Um, I have the quality and safety roles, accreditation and regulatory, uh, clinical operations improvement, um, quality, safety. Um, I have uh, some unusual things, I think, for a chief clinical officer, pharmacy and supply chain roll up to me, um, and a couple of other functions. 
But really, you know, from a strategic perspective, I really try hard to make sure that in all the conversations that we have as a health system and everything that we do in terms of planning, capital deployment uh, and, and strategic planning, that we make sure that we focus on the clinical needs of our community and our patients. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I really try to focus my efforts around. Well, just to follow up on that a bit, so what would you say your top several priorities are? I mean, you really cover the waterfront in terms of your responsibilities. What are your several top priorities, Tom? You know, I think they're, they're relatively simple, Gary, and I think a lot cascades from them. I think, simply put, you know, my single overarching priority for, uh, for what I do within this health system is to drive what we call care signature which is it should be the expectation of any person, any patient, any family that touches uh, anywhere that we practice within our geography, that, that they can get the same high quality, safe care and it's consistent no matter where we go. And we're putting a lot of effort into that. It, it, you know, lots of places have, you know, low, uh, low side of excellent care. Few places have that consistency and uh, the expectation that it's, that's, that's really high quality and consistent everywhere you go, that no matter where you present within our health system with a diagnosis, you are assured of the same evaluation, the same therapy, the same outcome. I think that's a, that's a, that's a very tall order, and it's something that we're very passionate about. Mm-hmm. You can't help but think also, too, that as an industry, you know, uh, medical care is too expensive. You know, we as healthcare providers need to be focused on providing value. And we define the value equation as the quality of care, the safety of that care, and the experience that patients and their families experience during the episode of care as the numerator of that value equation, with the denominator being the ultimate price or the cost of that care. And it's really critical for us as clinicians to focus on that value equation and have our voice be heard because it's not about being too expensive or less expensive. It's about being uh, high quality, safe, with a great experience at a price point that is affordable. Mm -hmm. Tom, I'm interested in the evolution of the role of the senior clinical uh, leader in the the house. Um, And there's been changes in titles, used to be chief medical officer, now the senior person is frequently chief clinical officer. But how would you say the role of the senior clinical leader in these large health systems, how has that evolved over the last 10 or 15 years? That's a great question, Gary. And, you know, I I know this institution, I spent my entire life here and I've got colleagues around the country, you know, and and I think that we have evolved similarly, I think, to many of the other health systems in the United States where, you know, first we were a hospital Then we were a group of hospitals that came together for purposes of supply chain and whatever economies of scale and back office functions that we could gather. And now we are evolving into a much more highly integrated set of institutions to drive things like care signature that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And I think that as we have evolved, it's really important to me as a clinician that the clinical voice remains very active in the discussion in the C-suite and in the strategic planning because at the end of the day, you know, bigger it can't just be for getting bigger. It has to actually serve the purpose for the patients in the communities. And I think that the clinician voice, whether it be embodied by a physician or some other clinician, I think is critically important. So I think as time has progressed, and as you mentioned, the role has changed from chief of staff to chief medical officer to now on an enterprise level for an institution like ours to chief clinical officer, I think it recognizes the importance of not just making sure that that you've got the physicians credentialed and that there's some baseline safety and quality program, but that it infuses in everything that the health system does and that it is important in the strategic planning for what the health system does next. I imagine size uh, in this case was helpful during the COVID uh, uh, eruptions, basically. Um, is that true? I mean, did you think that you were better able to respond to the community need because you had access to the resources that you do at, at Yale New Haven Health? Yeah, there's no question. That was 
one of the elements, not the only, but one of the elements that helped us survive the deluge of patients that we saw in March and April uh, of 2020. You know, given our proximity to New York, very early in March, uh, as the pandemic swept up from New York City, we felt that down in Greenwich and it ran right along the I-95 corridor north, right through New Haven, right up through uh, New London in the, in the Rhode Island border. And it was our size, but it was also the level of integration that we've been able uh, to, to develop. And it was really incredibly obvious where we had succeeded in integrating and where we still had opportunities to continue to integrate. You know, we have a, a system, uh, we have a system formulary for our pharmacy and our pharmacy is a single function. We have a single instance of Epic, for example. And so we were very easy and able to be able to place uh, into production very rapidly, a care signature pathway uh, for the treatment of COVID on the inpatient side, on the outpatient side, uh, and it was rapidly uh, accepted across the entire health system because of that single instance of Epic, because uh, we had that single pharmacy, for example. You know, we had uh, longstanding, well-functioning uh, practice groups that looked at standardization for ED practice, for ICU practice, and we were really able to leverage those so that we were very uh, rapidly able to uh, roll out uh, care pathway protocols uh, in pivot when we needed to assess our ventilator stock or when we were changing our drug utilization or how we did proning, for example. And it was really amazing to see uh, when I would round in Westerly Hospital in Westerly, Rhode Island, a small institution with a very, very small ICU that had never proned a patient prior to the pandemic was very, uh, very able to easily assemble the team and the, and the um, necessary uh, expertise to put patients on their bellies, something that we know worked in COVID. And, and we did it with the same frequency and I, 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 amazingly with the same clinical outcomes as the rest of the health system. Mm -hmm. and, and that was only able because of the degree of integration. But yeah. it also pointed out areas where we hadn't integrated, but yet the need exists because if those infrastructures aren't the same, then we have challenges in making good on our care signature uh, promise. So for example, respiratory therapy had different leaders at each delivery network, and there was very little communication between respiratory therapists uh, in their leadership across our health system. Mm -hmm. Something that, you know, like many support functions feels very local, but when you get into a rapidly evolving environment like the pandemic, you want to be able to pivot rapidly. And it's hard to do that when you don't have some degree of standardization and integration. Right. Well, you're talking really about the benefits of scale and the benefits of integration and the benefits of, of a common data system across all your uh, delivery sites. Um, what about the burden on doctors and nurses of our data systems? Um, it seems really uh, in the history of delivery of institutional care, the data systems are pretty new. So we're just really now getting used to it. But where do we stand in terms of this burden on doctors and nurses of, uh, of the data systems? Yeah, it's something that we hear about every day, isn't it? I mean, you know, um, I'm in this role partly because uh, w when we went live with our first computerized physician order entry, and you remember that back in the early days of the quality movement, that every institution was expected to have CPOE because it was going to drive down errors and it was going to improve quality of care and efficiency, and it's going to reduce the burden on physicians. And, you know, I think it's done some of those things. I think the improvement in quality and the, our ability to standardize, I think is unassailable. I think we've been, I think, less served in terms of the burden on clinicians. And that's something we need to pay attention to. You know, I, I think I mentioned to you some time ago that, it's really amazing to me that while automation, technology, uh, and other kinds of advancements have helped you know, reduce the burden on virtually every other workforce in every other industry while simultaneously reducing costs, I think healthcare may be unique in that technology, the layers of technology while improving care and perhaps some degrees of efficiency have added the workflow burden to the clinicians and increased expense because of the cost of that technology. 
And I think that we need to go back and re-engineer ourselves, help uh, other vendors and things, help re uh, 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 re-engineer so that we can actually gather some of those benefits that right now I think feel like deficits. It feels like last year really was the first kind of year of uh, of full data integration in a lot of our health systems. And it feels like this decade, if I said last year, I meant last decade. And it feels like this decade, uh, we'll begin to realize the benefits along the lines of what you're talking about. To that end, you've got a great analogy about your old uh, cars that uh, you haven't built and the controls there and and how that's changed over time. Can you share that uh, analogy? I with know us? That, that, that made you laugh the first time I mentioned it to you, but you know, it's, it's, it's not just the EMR, it's really all technology. It's the yeah. technology of, of imaging, it's the technology of laboratory availability. You know, if it weren't for the technology of polymerase chain reaction, we wouldn't have a good test right now for, um, for COVID. I mean, all of these technologies have given us so much additional information have contributed to so many healthcare uh, advances, but just really in, in just my lifetime, I feel like we've gone from small amount of technology to overwhelming amount. And, you know, as you say, I, I, I have an analogy that I use sometimes, you know, my old, I, I, I have a number of antique automobiles. My, the oldest car I have is a 1914 Model T. It, it, has, it has no gauges. There's no indication of speed or oil pressure, temperature, I don't have an odometer on it. If I want to know how much gas is in the gas tank, I have to pick up the seat and put a stick, literally a yardstick, into the tank, which is underneath my seat, to tell me how much gas is in it. And, you know, that was sort of technology. That was high tech circa yeah. 1914. <laughs> my next car is a 1931 car that actually has a speedometer, and that's it. The gas tank is actually a cork on a piece of a wire that has an indicator. So that, that shows you in 25 years or 20 years how much technology improved. And then I have a 39, 1939 car, so only eight years later, that's got six gauges. And, you know, I, my the last car I owned was from the early 2000s, and it was a turbocharged car, and it had every kind of gauge and to the point where you never even knew what those gauges meant or what to do about them. It would measure exhaust temperature and how much turbo boost there was and oil temperature, things that you don't even have any idea what you would do with. And I feel like that's where we are with medicine today, which is yeah. there are so much data coming at you, much of which is noise or you don't know what to do with it or you need special expertise to interpret. We need to move beyond that phase to where I am in my, I have a Tesla that all it has is a television screen and I can look for data, but really it just tells me whether my battery is okay or not. And when I decide that I'm going to go get a supercharger top up of my battery, it doesn't ask me, you know, how far the supercharger is away or what I need to do to prepare the battery. It does all of that. It senses when the supercharger is near, when I'm navigating to it, it preps it all for me. So all I have to do is plug it in. And I think that's where I think the promise of technology can really make good on what we need as clinicians, which is to take all of those disparate inputs. And, you know, my Tesla could do what my old turbocharged car did, which is to give me all of this data, which I didn't understand and couldn't take action on. But instead what it does is it uses technology in the background that I don't necessarily see, but it takes the data and turns it into information. And I think that's where we are today. Is we need less data that our brains can't process, but we need more actionable information. And I think maybe, as you said, you know, the last decade is different than this. And I think the promise of AI and I think the promise of where technology is going can get us there, but we need to embrace it. We need to be smarter about using it and we need to be part of the solution and we need to help guide where it's going. If we sit back and just complain about where we are, I don't think we'll ever make meaningful progress. No, here, here. That's so well said. Tom, let's get back to COVID for a minute, um, which many of us feel that the real heroes in the last several years have been our caregivers, uh, just under a lot of pressure that uh, those of us that haven't really been close to it, I think, can't 
uh, appreciate. But how do you describe that? How do you think about that, Tom? Yeah, I mean, there, there is nothing in my career so far that has given me as much hope for the future of healthcare as this past pandemic. And the way that our staff, I'm sure, you know, other staffs across the country um, have turned out in support of our communities and our patients, it's nothing short of absolutely remarkable. And it wasn't just the direct clinical staff either, Gary. You know, when we were rolling out testing, we made it available to everyone who worked for the health system. When we were rolling out vaccination, we did the same because it was in recognition of the fact that even those who worked outside of clinical realms lent whatever hand they had possible to keep our enterprise open, functioning, and as a, you know, as a haven for care in our community. And, and I really, really mean that. It has been truly remarkable. You know, in this very early spring, a very one quick story, in the early spring of 2020, um, you know, when our ORs were essentially empty, when people weren't seeking care because they were afraid, you know, we had all this OR staff that basically had nothing to do. And we base, you know, we said, we're not going to lay people off. We're not going to furlough. And they sought out opportunities to figure out where they could help. This is just one anecdote among thousands. Yeah. And, you know, our CRNAs and anesthesiologists opened up extra ICUs given their c- critical care skills in our, in our post-operative care units. Our scrub techs, this is a fun one. Our scrub techs uh, realized that many of our staff didn't know exactly how to properly don and doff PPE. Remember those terms, don and doff? Yep, yep. And they, they termed themselves doffers, And they went out there and they made sure that people truly understood how to put on and take off the personal protective equipment. And then they, they actually taught classes and then they walked around and provided assistance and they observed. And it was just amazing to see all of the different nooks and crannies where we had opportunity for help. And then they organically, our staff, whether it be the OR staff or others that didn't have immediacy needs, found ways to help. And then, of course, there are the folks that we always talk about that were on the front lines in our ICUs that uh, really felt the brunt, particularly in the first wave. Um, they were just truly heroic in how they faced this pandemic uh, with, with just the steady resolve that they were going to get it done uh, and they were going to be able to take care of patients. A number of the CEOs that I've spoken to have used the term battle when it came to that period of time and those people, and it said it was uh, just remarkable. Uh, The downside is that some of them gave so much that it seemed to have burned themselves out. Uh, Is that still kind of lingering as, as an issue that you're having to work with, Tom? Absolutely, Gary. And I I think like any battle, I think the, you know, the aftershocks are going to be felt for years to come. Um, You know, we're already in the midst of a demographic change. You know, our our employees are getting older. Uh, The number of individuals going into our profession uh, or entering the workforce uh, in general is that that number is smaller than those that are aging and retiring. So this, this against the background of that demographic shift, I, I think we have this new challenge, which is the stress that people have felt, how it's disrupted their lives. And I think we're only just seeing the beginning of that. The question is, is what do we do with it? You know, we can't choose our circumstances. I think what we can choose is our reaction to it. You know, we were already, you know, we have been in the discussion ourselves and other organizations like ours about how do we handle the demographic shift how do we hurt, handle the aging workforce? And, and I think this is going to accelerate and add a new dom- dimension to those discussions. Um, I think it's an incredibly important uh, discussion. You know, we're in the people business. We take care of people in their communities. In order to do so, it's highly person intensive, and that's not changing anytime soon. You know, we're we're not an industry that can outsource to a computer or AI large swaths of what we do. I think we need to look for those opportunities, but at the end of the day, humans in need need human touch and we're always gonna be that way. So we have to figure out how we're gonna approach this uh, new set of challenges and, and make sure that our staff are feeling that we're supporting them, that they have the tools that they need, 
And look, I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have now is competition. I mean, as wage pressure hits, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, we're now competing with parts of the economy we never thought we would compete with. You know, Amazon opens a warehouse and all of a sudden uh, we find ourselves in a real shortage of, of individuals. Um, that's a surprise. I mean, we were always a good, steady employer that provided a livable wage. Um, and I think that uh, I think that the competition has changed and we're going to need to we're going to need to respond. Tom, another thing that came up was a little bit of the blurring of uh, our uh, care institutions like hospitals and health systems and a public health infrastructure. I'm thinking of all the testing that Yale New Haven did, all the vaccinations that you gave. Uh, do you think going forward that there will be closer proximity between public health and uh, institutional care delivery? Well, I certainly hope so, Gary. I mean, I think that's very location specific. You know, the other thing that happened was, um, as our governor would say, is that there was really very little coming out of the White House in the early part of the pandemic. And it really looked towards the states. And, and we were one of the states, I think, that we got together uh, as a group of hospitals across the state, together with the governor's office and his team. And we put together a plan for how we would load balance if need be, how, do we, how we would respond together. Um, and it was really, I think, heartwarming for many of us, particularly, you know, the, those of us who live and work in the state for many years, to see how all of these competitive organizations came together to make sure that we didn't leave any of our cities or towns behind. As you say, you know, we provided a, a network of testing sites. And then when vaccinations were available uh, at the end of 2020 into 21, you know, we really, uh, our uh, health systems, with some help from some of the local health departments really vaccinated the state. Um, right. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I don't feel that there's a, 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 a real mandate to develop a public health infrastructure. Um, I think that's really going to continue to fall uh, to, depending on what state you live in, depending on what locale you're in, to, the organiza to us as organizations. I think that's something that we're going to continue to have to pick up. Yeah. Another, another thing in kind of that line is the whole... Um, role of the epidemiologist in the health systems, particularly in terms of data prediction and anticipation of waves and so on. Um, did that happen at, at Yale New Haven? Did that whole role of the epidemiologist kind of up, up its level of visibility uh, in the institution? Yeah, it's one of, it's one of the places where um, I, I think the interesting and unique crucible that is our community, uh, I think really served us well. You know, being a small town uh, in New Haven with a world-class university and all those resources, it was an incredible boon for us. To have the College of Engineering, the School of Public Health, of course, the School of Medicine and all those resources associated to be able to do wastewater analysis, to be able to do predictive modeling. You know, in the School of Public Health, to have that capacity in a research laboratory to do uh, sequencing to identify variants, all of that right here in this you know city of a hundred thousand people within three blocks of one another, uh, you know, all of that was incredibly useful for us for not just modeling what would be coming, um, but also trying to deal with the pandemic in the middle of it. Um, and, and have all those resources together. And, you know, as you saw in the national literature, there was a huge amount of work that came out of, of the school, the university uh, that helped, I think, inform how to respond and what should be done nationally. Um, but certainly we felt it here in New Haven and across our health system. I'm thinking of now of the independent physicians and what's been reported around the country is that the economics of COVID uh, really has caused uh, a number of the independent physicians to try to uh, find employment in health systems. They just don't think they can make it as independent docs or small groups. Um, what do you think about that, Tom? Do you see that trend unfolding? You know, Gary, I think that um, it, it has accelerated uh, some of those physicians to try to seek uh, I think a safer harbor or haven. 
Um, what we've tried to do within our health system is to be agnostic to physicians' desire for how they would practice. And, you know, of course, we have a faculty practice plan. Uh, some physicians choose to join the faculty practice plan, particularly those with academic, research, education interests. Uh, we've got a not-for-profit physician foundation as part of our health system. Uh, another avenue for uh, employment if a physician chooses. Uh, but still, you know, still around 50 to 60 percent of our admissions uh, are coming from community-based physicians that, as you point out, are increasingly struggling um, partly because of COVID and the reduction in some of the ambulatory uh, elective revenue that happened, uh, particularly back in 2020, but also the cost pressures of inflation and, and wage in, uh, acceleration. So we're seeing some of those physicians uh, seek employment, um, and we're struggling hard with how to make sure that our communities remain well served by them. I, mm -hmm. I think our job as a health system is not to tell physicians how or where they should practice or how they should be employed, but instead try to uh, make sure that we've got an adequate uh, physician and medical staff across all of our hospitals and provide you know, the most uh, beneficial environment, no matter what that type of arrangement that that physician seeks. Doing so at the community docs because of Stark and other rules, as you know, uh, can be a real challenge. Yeah. Um, but there, there are certain things we can do. Um, but actually, sometimes just listening to those physicians, what their challenges are, and trying to come up with creative solutions is an important first step uh, mm -hmm. that, that I think is often overlooked. Yeah, and thinking about academic medical centers and their financing, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that we really don't do enough to make sure that financing medical education and our academic medical centers is sufficient. What thoughts do you have about that, Tom? No, I think you're right, Gary. I mean, you know, the, the academic medical centers in the United States, uh, I think are the really the crown jewel, one of the crown jewels of the healthcare system in, in the United States. And, you know, historically there have been funding mechanisms, whether it be dish payments in some instances, certainly GME and IME payments in others that actually have helped recognize the important role that teaching institutions play in American medicine. And, you know, as an academic, we've seen an erosion of a lot of those uh, Medicare line item funds for a lot of those uh, circumstances. I, I worry about that. I think it's relatively short-sighted to continue to erode that sort of support. Um, and I think that, you know, in large part, uh, the United States through those mechanisms, through the NIH uh, and, and other funding mechanisms has supported medical advancements across the world. And, and we export those medical advancements as an as a international good. Um, I think when you're sitting down and trying to put together the fiscal year 2023 budget like we're doing right now, and you're looking at the cost of education uh, and many of the unfunded mandates, you know, we ourselves, uh, across our health system, we're over our GME cap uh, for residents. Um, you know, we know that we receive substantially less funding for residency training uh, than, than it costs us to provide that training. Um, every year, it seems that the ACGME adds an additional uh, expense that we can't get uh, reimbursed for, uh, additional demand for, you know, supervision or, or coordinator, what have you, that there is no additional reimbursement for. It, 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 it feels a little bit, uh, I think I'm crying in my soup a little bit, but it feels a little bit like it's not valued in the United States. Look, we're expensive. What are we now? 18% of GDP. Um, and we need to find a way to uh, not become the GD, not be the GDP hog that we are. I just think that uh, underfunding or cutting the funding of education and research, uh, I think is relatively short, is very short-sighted uh, for us. But again, when someone comes in to have a cholecystectomy, a gallbladder removal, and says, why do you command a premium as an academic medical center? I think all of us are, uh, I think we're challenged to be able to answer that question. Now, if you're uh, sick with a rare disease, if you're sick with a disease that's hard to diagnose, the, the equation is very clear. But for routine care, which we provide a lot of, I think it's hard to, it's hard to justify. Um, yet the outcome, particularly the outcome uh, beyond the patient, 
I think is un completely unassailable. Well, there's clearly problems uh, across the system. We all know that, but I agree with you that uh, going after medical education is not the way to do it. I, I think part of the problem is that we just are so used to <laughs> excellent training for physicians uh, that we kind of accepted that and uh, we don't value it as highly as we ought to. It's my personal opinion. But... No, you're right. I mean, look, we're, we're an international magnet for graduate medical education training. I mean, you know, as many people have said, not only are we probably the best medical educators in the world, we're also the best sick care system in the world. If you're sick, if you're truly ill with something that's hard to work on, diagnose, treat, then there's no other place in the world you want to be other than the United States. Right. Yeah, that's for sure. Thinking about clinical practice, and you were commenting on this earlier, but let me ask the question directly. And that is, as we make progress, uh, precision medicine comes to mind. You made reference to the data systems and AI and whatnot. Uh, will we, over the course of the next 10 or 20 years, will we begin to attract different type of people into medicine than we have in the past? Do you see that happening, Tom, or not? I don't know, Gary. I, I think, you know, the human body and the human condition is so central to who we are. It will always attract, I think, the smartest, brightest, most compassionate people. I don't see that changing. Um, you know, I, I think that the bigger question is, is what's the skill set? Once you've got the mindset, what's the skill set you need? And is medical education right now appropriately set up to give those brightest, smartest, most compassionate individuals that will be attracted to medicine, the right skill set to be the caregivers for the next generation? I think that's the question we should be asking. Yeah, that is a question we should ask and devote some resources to it. Fundamentally important. Tom, this has been a, just an awesome interview as expected. Thank you very much for your time. I've got two questions uh, for you just to wrap up. One of them is for those young people that come to you and say, Dr. Balzac, I think I'm interested in a career in medicine. What advice do you have for them? Well, first of all, I'd say congratulations. I mean, as I mentioned, if you're smart, and you care about the human condition, I think there's no better thing to do than pursue uh, a career in healthcare. And by the way, that doesn't have to be a physician. There are lots of different ways to pursue a career in healthcare. And I think people get locked into tracks and I think they should think about what it is, is that motivates them. What are they interested in? And if you're interested in healthcare, go for it. If you're closed out because of an MCAT score or admission to a school, that's fine. There's lots of other ways to contribute. It's, and personally, and my wife and I have had this conversation innumerable times. If, even if I didn't go into healthcare, I think a medical education is incredibly interesting from, a, from an intellectual perspective. It's gratifying from a personal perspective. The human body is an amazing machine to get to know. And I think the rigors of an education can serve you well, no matter what you want to do in your career. So the reason why I say that is if you are going down the pathway of a medical education and decide at some point it's not for you, that's not, there's no, there's no time lost or wasted there. Cause I think the education, the rigor with which you're you know, applying yourself to get that education, that's useful. So I would say, go for it. It is, it is a noble profession. I think you should be proud to serve in that capacity, to try to make human life better. Uh, and so I, I would encourage anyone who wants to, to pursue it. It's a great place to be. Yeah. Well said. Final question, Tom, uh, somewhat similar, but what advice do you have for up and coming leaders? Well, you know, people who are interested in leadership, seek those opportunities out. Say yes. You know, folks will come to me and say, well, how do I get involved? My answer is, is say yes to the things that are being offered you. Opportunity favors the person who looks for it. And, you know, I've had so many examples where I've had 
I've talked to physicians and I've said, well, you know, we're really interested in working on, well, pick, pick your least favorite topic, length of stay or, you know, reduction of serious safety events. Well, I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in this. Well, you can't really pick what the opportunity is. I, I think opportunity will find you if you're the person who always attracts that opportunity. So raise your hand, say yes, be enthusiastic and be genuine. I think if you're interested in leadership, then you know, you'll be able to choose where you go, but you may not often be, uh, you may not be able to choose what the challenges you face. And you always have to realize that you, you, you have to take the challenges as they arise. You can't say, well, that one I'm not interested in, I'll take the next one. Wisdom from a very experienced and really terrific leader. Tom, thanks so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Thank you, Gary. It's always really, really enjoyable to talk to you.